Chris, thank you for such a kind introduction. I always wish that I invite my mom to listen to these introductions. <laughs> See, there's actually good stuff that we do here. So um, welcome to AI and the Cost of Trials, the Impact of Real World and Real-Time Evidence. Uh, my name is Krishna Yashwant. Uh, as Chris said, I'm a general partner at Google Ventures and a primary care doc uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, and with me today, we have a fantastic panel. Uh, so I'm going to start um, by asking everybody to give a brief introduction, but I'll, I'll start with a preface, and then uh, everybody will do like 20, 30 second introduction, just so everybody has some context as to who we're talking uh, to here, and then we'll get into all the questions. So this is a conversation about the cost of trials, and uh, and trials have always had math and statistical analysis as a core part of them, uh, and they will continue to be essential tools. But with the rise of AI, there's a growing interest in applying AI and machine learning-based analyses to improve the efficiency and reduce the reduce the costs of clinical trials. But where is AI poised to have the greatest impact in trials? Where are the greatest opportunities and greatest challenges? Is there enough data to power AI in this space? And what are the risks of moving ahead? <coughs> with AI-based approaches in clinical trials. These are some of the issues we'll talk about today, and I'm sure we'll go far off the beaten path uh, with this group. Um, but perhaps with that, I'll start with Amy. And you can just provide a, a brief introduction, and we'll just go down the line here. Hi, I'm Amy Abernathy. I am the Chief Medical and Chief Scientific Officer at a health tech startup in New York City called Flatiron Health. We focus on building software for oncologists, and then through that software, we pull in data, which we then process and clean up, and we use data at large scale to um, serve questions in evidence development and research. Uh, before joining Flatiron, I was a professor of medicine at Duke. I'm an oncologist by background, and some of you may know that Flatiron was recently acquired by Roche um, in February. Ramesh? Hi, I'm Ramesh Dervasala with uh, Eli Lilly. I'm responsible for IT and informatics in support of the research labs at Lilly. I was a biophysicist by training, and I'm a recovering computational chemist. Colin. I'm Colin Hill. I'm the CEO and co-founder of GNS Healthcare. Um, we, we focus on the application of causal machine learning and simulation to discover what works for whom, both in clinical development and in the real world. I am also on the board of directors of PPD, which is one of the largest clinical trial companies in the world, and then Biotelemetry Inc. Hi, I'm Jackie Hunter. I'm the chief executive of Benevolent Bio. We are a drug discovery company that applies the technology, specifically AI, machine learning, natural language processing, that's developed by our sister company, Benevolent Tech, uh, to, drug, uh, to discover our own pipeline of drugs and molecules. We mine hundreds of millions of documents, extract relevant biomedical information, and use it to identify new targets, design better molecules. And more recently, we also have started to use the technology to mine clinical data and clinical trial information. And I've, in the past, was also a director of a CRO at Chilton. So my name is uh, Joseph Sheeran. I'm uh, the senior advisor of R&D and Bayer. I have about 35 years of um, R&D experience within the pharmaceutical industry, mainly within the field of regulatory affairs, and have uh, been active um, uh, in many different countries. I'm trying to gain the trust of the regulators uh, doing my, my job, and I hope that uh, the trust uh, which <coughs> we will have in the data, because we are coming together from different uh, companies, companies which are data companies and companies which are developing a new medical products. We need to have the trust in each other in order to advance public health and also for the interest of the patient. The um, other topic is that I'm uh, uh, within the board of directors of the DIA, the Drug Information Association, and I'm the chair elect and um, we will have here in Boston our annual meeting in June. Great. Hi, I'm Steve Wiviat. I'm the uh, executive director of the Clinical Trials Office for Partners Healthcare. Uh, this is a group that helps to support and grow uh, clinical trials uh, through effective collaboration between uh, the uh, academic investigators at our partners hospitals and industry collaborators. Uh, in addition to that, I'm a clinical cardiologist uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. 
uh, and a practicing clinical trialist with the <coughs> Timmy Study Group. Uh, I've been doing clinical trials uh, in acute coronary syndromes and in cardiovascular risk prevention uh, for the last 15 years. Thank you, guys. So as you can see, a phenomenal panel here with a lot of different types of experience. Um, so you know, as we approach this, maybe I'll start with Stephen. Uh, Stephen, can you just take a step back before we dive into the details of uh, AI and the data and clinical trials? You know, can you provide a framework uh, for what a clinical trial is uh, to begin with and where you see the areas that are ripe for data, machine learning, and just general advancement? Um, sure. So, so I thought it would, would actually be helpful um, to give you a bit of a work uh, example. So uh, presently, I'm the um, global principal investigator of a large cardiovascular outcomes trial of a, a diabetes drug, an SGLT2 inhibitor uh, that's been developed for diabetes and is being tested for cardiovascular safety and efficacy. And so uh, this is a 17,000 patient clinical trial that's being run worldwide. Uh, the reason uh, that we're doing this clinical trial is really the reason that we do uh, all clinical trials is that uh, these studies um, are a, a specific type of study uh, that involves the randomization of a, a therapy or a therapeutic strategy with the idea that randomization allows for uh, the uh, assessment of both uh, measured and unmeasured confounders. Uh, and allows you to develop a causal relationship between the exposure to the therapy uh, and the outcomes that, that are measured. Uh, this is different than other kinds of uh, observational data, of course. Um, but as we think about this trial that we're running now, uh, this trial will take on the order of about seven years to complete from the time we design the protocol until we present the data, and will cost on the order of a half a billion dollars uh, for the sponsor to, to complete this study. Okay, and so when we think about that, there really are efficiencies in potentially all of the different areas uh, that are uh, required to run a clinical trial that may be uh, relevant to our, to our discussion today. So I think one of the areas is the consideration of what projects we choose. Uh, can we identify the appropriate targets, the appropriate therapies uh, that may de-risk some of these large and expensive projects to make sure that it's more likely that the trials would be positive? Uh, when we select uh, the uh, sites that are participating, uh, many of the sites that participate in our trials uh, will be trained, will fly to investigator meetings, and may enroll no patients in, in the clinical trial. So finding trials that fit with the institution, fit with the practice, is, is very important. Uh, once you identify the appropriate uh, uh, sites for participation, uh, allowing those sites to efficiently uh, identify patients who are appropriate for that, that clinical study. Uh, it may take several hundred sites to enroll a 17,000 patient trial, uh, and most of the sites en enroll very small numbers of patients. The, the data tends to be of higher quality when we have sites that are able to identify an appropriate set of, set of patients. Uh, how can we make sure that the patients who are coming into the trials are the right patients for the study, that they're committed to the studies, that they'll stay on study drug, uh, that they'll uh, remain in follow-up, what we say is, is worse than a site that doesn't enroll patients is a site that enrolls a lot of patients and those patients don't stay in the studies. So identifying the right patients that are gonna come in uh, and stay in the studies. Uh, there are humans that travel all over the world uh, looking at individual uh, data points in these studies, monitoring, you heard from the group here, that there are uh, uh, contract research organizations that's, that send hundreds of people all over the world to monitor these studies. Uh, looking for uh, the quality of the data and research misconduct. Are we doing that correctly? Is that the right way to be doing these things? Um, we are, then when we uh, complete the studies, uh, we're analyzing the data with our pre-specified assessments for regulatory approval, uh, for publication. And then there's also an enormous amount of data that is generated uh, for data mining, from biosensors, from, bio, uh, from biomarkers, uh, from genetic samples uh, that can inform uh, future studies. So I think all the way from the choosing the right product uh, to analyzing the data at the end of the trial, there's probably room for improvement. So let me just highlight that for a second. So choosing projects, choosing the sites slash enrolling the patients, mm -hmm. efficiency, efficiently identifying the right patients, mm -hmm. uh, and then analyzing the data. This is kind of the framework that we can use. So, 
Can I add uh, a couple of um, uh, words to um, what uh, Stefan has just described? If you look at the AI uh, environment and what you can do with it is um, in all these steps which uh, Stefan indicated, you can improve uh, the, uh, the process. Uh, the accrual of the patients can be much quicker if you have identified them up front. You can reduce the time of the trial itself by, for example, if you have an event-driven trial, having the patients up front quicker in the trial, the events will uh, uh, occur earlier. And by that token, you can stop the trial probably earlier. We have spent quite some time after the trial has stopped nowadays to clean the data, what we call cleaning the data, which takes up from one month to two months. And that whole period you can then shrink to probably one day. Um, the writing of the report can be started when the protocol is written by automatically transfer it into a frame of the, um, the clinical report and by predefining the tables and other sets of data which are going into the report, you can then have that automatically transferred to that report as well so that the report writing itself can be very much shortened. Uh, so I think overall, if you look at that overall gain you can have, you're talking about something like 30 to 40% of the time you can gain. And as everybody knows in R&D, speed is everything. Okay, so the promise is there. We have these incredibly expensive trials, half a billion dollars uh, running through one clinical trial in the country uh, in one system here. Um, and the opportunity for real impact, uh, gaining efficiencies throughout multiple stages of that. Amy, where do you see it being ready today? Uh, where are we there? Where are we still, where do we still have a long way to go in terms of is the data ready? Can we really apply AI today to, to all of these parts? Or, or where, where are we? Give us a sense. So, so it's interesting. One of the things I've been hearing um, in each of the sessions today is the importance of getting the data right. And I think we now are at a place where we can start to see how this opportunity of data and AI can be truly applied to clinical trials right now. So some of the um, examples that you've put forward, um, I think we've got across all therapeutic areas examples of really high quality data sets that can help get this right. So we've got data sets available now that can help us pick the project better and identify what are the problems to be solved? We've got data sets available, some of them proprietary, some of them public, that are, um, can reliably help us pick clinical trial sites that know what they're doing and have the right patient population for the protocol at hand. Um, there are other tasks where the availability of data sets um, is a bit more scattered. Um, so, what, for example, um, at Flatiron Health, one of the things we think a lot about is how do we generate very high quality data sets that can be used to populate the clinical trial data set? Because practically speaking, a clinical trial is just the development of a really big data set, reliable enough to answer the question at hand. And so in fact, in oncology, we're starting to get to the place really I think in the next six to 12 months, you'll be able to see it in action of being able to populate the clinical trials data set with data that can be relied upon by regulators. And that takes me to my last piece, which is that you know in the here and now and, and probably um, in the next two years across therapeutic areas, we'll have more and more data that are reliable um, for our key stakeholders in the clinical trial space, which are EMA, FDA, and um, sponsors who are trying to understand if their therapy works. And so I call that regulatory gray data. So these are data sets that have traceability back to source, complete variables, and you understand the quality of the underlying information. Let me ask this, uh, maybe I'll ask this to Amy Ramesh, and Joseph, because each of you are kind of representing a bit more of the, the pharma side and, and you know, can have seen this from the clinical trial side, but you know, is it the case that we have equal access to data across all indications? I mean, you know, as you were just talking about it, Amy, there's a real opportunity in oncology because you have the data, we've seen the data in the context of Flatiron. Uh, Eli Lilly is obviously doing a lot of work in, in these spaces, and Bayer also is touching many of these different uh, data sources, but is it the case that uh, uh, that there's certain indications where we have the data uh, and others that we don't, or, or is, is there a broader access uh, based on the type of data that we're looking at? I'll, I'll let you both start and then I'll kind of follow, follow on. Okay, well then I start. Um, 
I think we have, uh, in most of the indication setting, in most therapeutic areas, data available. Um, the FDA has a Sentinel program and has about 178 million patients in that uh, program. Um, and they are able to do studies within that, uh, within that data set. It's mainly claim database uh, information, and hence it has some biases in it. Um, they're doing quite a lot of studies in the moment in order to see if they can reproduce the uh, outcome of uh, randomized clinical trials. Um, the PMDA, which is the Japanese uh, uh, authorities, they have uh, 10 medical institutions, uh, which encompass about 23 hospitals with about 4 million patients in that data set. And they have come to an accuracy of about 100%, which is um, something which within the US is not, not feasible in the moment yet. But they have standardized the data collection and the uh, input of the data into the systems and are able to now conduct uh, with that data set not only safety-related uh, uh, studies, but also efficacy-related studies. What, what's the source of the data in that last one that has 100% uh, concordance, the Japanese data set? Is that claims data, or what's, what's in that data set? That's the hospital data. The so data coming from, from the, the EMR hospital. itself. Yeah. So you were mentioning claims data earlier. I mean, is that good enough for the sort of uh, regulatory and clinical insights that we want to derive from these data sets? Well, at least in these claim databases, it's being, being used for the, to address safety-related questions. And um, the FDA thinks that this is a very good tool in order to address safety-related questions. Um, so from that perspective, I think that the regulators are pretty happy with the data they're getting. And of course, you have to take into account the biases which are in these databases. And there are different statistical tools you can use in order to avoid some of these biases or to overcome some of these biases. So I think that there's, there's certainly access to a lot of data sets out there, but the challenge is you know, standardization of the data. That's a huge piece of it. And making sure that we're comparing apples to apples when you integrate multiple data sets together. So there's certainly a lot of claims data. There's a lot of public data that's being put out there. Governments are certainly getting involved. And, and these days, you're seeing a lot more state health systems starting to aggregate all of their EMR, EMR data across their own systems. So, so there's a whole bunch of data out there, but what are we looking at? Are we comparing an apple to an apple is a really big challenge. And so building models, building AI capabilities on top of multiple data sets integrated together is a really tricky space that I'm not sure we're ready for. And, and I would argue that in addition, it is different by therapeutic area. Yeah. So for example, we do have claims data across all therapeutic areas. And, and I would say that you don't leave really anybody out in that, in that zone. Mm -hmm. Um, however, if you want to, for example, have clinical data tied to other kinds of deep data sets like genomics data, you need clinical data that includes both structured and unstructured data. So you need data processing that puts those two together and then the ability to link in other data sets like very complete genomics data. I would argue right now oncology is leading the way as exemplar of what that might look like, but really shows us this is what the path looks like, and we have the responsibility to start to figure that out in other areas. And I think it does depend on really the key question you're going after. So if it's around the discovery of biomarkers to stratify patients in trials, which is a key part of increasing the efficiency and success of trials, then you're talking about typically multi-omic data. And in that realm, oncology dominates for sure. I'd say about half of all clinical trials initiated today and that we uh, crunch data on are, are in oncology, and I'd say followed by autoimmune diseases and uh, ultimately brain diseases. And I think it really has to do with where is the most complex biology? Because at the end of the day, I think the whole point of and the whole promise of AI in this field is transforming the plethora of data into computer models that allow us to understand the complex system of human disease so we can predict response to drugs and other interventions. And ultimately, we have to start getting to what type of machine learning enables us to do that. It's not a one size fits all. And this is where we start getting into the causal type of approaches to machine learning to get at, to get at the mechanisms of the system that created the data. 
So yeah, I mean, I think one of the other things is that the role of patient registries and diseases associations is really important for driving the standardization of data. So the ALS Society uh, and, and other uh, societies are very good at, for example, PROACT databases over 11,000 patients, just under 11,000 patients, and that's got a whole range of data and has been mined using technologies like machine learning to be able to pick up patients with different trajectories and pull out the right biomarkers. That, that hopefully will allow better stratification of patients going, going forward. But uh, the other thing I, I, which hasn't been mentioned, we've been talking very much about forward-looking and prospective analysis of trials. But pharmaceutical companies are sitting on huge swathes of data which could really inform better understanding of patients and patient endotypes uh, and, and really without AI and machine learning they haven't been able hitherto to analyze that data. Now with the technology we have that's opened a huge possibility to be able to re-look at all those uh, old trials and the data from those trials where the data is stored appropriately and be able to, to actually get some utility out of that data. As an industry, I think we've not been good at figuring out how to repurpose data. I mean, here we are talking about repurposing drugs. We don't know how to repurpose the data that we've already collected. So, you know, in basketball, they talk about one and done players. You play for one year in college and you immediately go to the NBA. We, we have one and, done, one and done data, right? You use it once, you put it away, you put it on a shelf and you never look at the data again because it's not useful for any other question than the original question for which the data was generated. So well, how do we repurpose the data? If the goal then is to accelerate clinical trials and reduce the cost, what's interesting is the data that's already been collected, whether that's in our electronic health records or, or prior clinical trials, can serve a number of tasks improving the efficiency of clinical trials. So we can use those data for study planning. We can also use those data now. One of the examples we just surfaced at AACR, the American Association of Cancer Research last week, is to be able to use those data to now simulate control arms, which reduce the chance that you need to have a control arm in a study and reduce the time um, and cost of studies, can, as can well as exposure that, patient. Can you walk through that, the control arm concept, uh, uh, a little bit slowly? Just sure. <laughs> <so we> <laughs> All that. right. Yeah. So um, in essence, uh, if you think about a randomized clinical trial, what we're doing is allocating patients in a randomized way to current standard of care versus the new intervention. What if um, you could essentially simulate what's going to happen in the standard of care arm so that now all you need to do is allocate patients to the new intervention and observe how they're going to do compared to standard of care? Um, at Flatiron, we've been able to demonstrate that we can do that in oncology um, for a number of drugs. And we're also now working on activities where you can pair retrospective data with small prospectively collected data sets in case you don't have full retrospective data sets to be able to do that. So we're also looking now towards hybrid um, simulated control arms. Practically speaking, what this means is at least in diseases like oncology where you have large effect sizes or sort of you anticipate that the new innovation is going to be substantially different than the standard of care you can actually now start to essentially test the new innovation against what's already being collected in data sets, such as the electronic health record. Let me just make sure I understand. So rather than having to run a clinical trial where you are recruiting a control arm and the intervention arm, you just recruit the intervention arm, and then using a uh, already collected data set, uh, you can uh, essentially virtually recruit a, uh, a control arm. Virtually recruit. I like that. Yes, that's exactly. Statement? So, yeah, Stephen, I, mean, I mean, yeah, yeah you're, I was just going to say, I think clinical trialists. You know, Amy's. Um, I think Amy made an important point in describing that process, which is that it really works in the setting of a large uh, and predictable outcome, right? So that if you have a new oncology drug that's likely to reduce mortality by forty percent over a period of a year or two, um, like some of the new uh, immuno oncology therapies that have recently been uh, reported on. You know, that certainly is a reasonable approach, and it actually increases the likelihood of recruitment because people are coming into oncology studies often because of the hopes of getting a therapy that's not otherwise available. When you're looking at things like public health uh, type problems like uh, diabetes or cardiovascular disease, um, where the therapies are already pretty good, um, where the event rates are much lower uh, and the effect sizes are smaller, 
um, then the assumptions that one might make in recruiting a virtual um, control arm would be uh, very relevant in terms of what the outcome of the trial would be. So I think we're not there yet in those other, other kinds of diseases. And one additional piece is it's got a lot to do with the reliability and accuracy of the underlying data sets. Mm -hmm. So the underlying data sets um, are frankly unreliable or you've got a lot of challenges with missing data, then it's very hard to simulate a control arm when the effect size is smaller. I mean, we're talking about pulling data from electronic medical records and from claims data and from biomarkers, all these other things. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how much can we trust that data? I mean, I'm, I'm a clinician and I see not me, but other people copy and paste notes all the time. You know, and, you know, does, it really, uh, does it really represent what's happening uh, in, the, you know, in that patient-doctor uh, interaction and in the care of the patient? Uh, is there heterogeneity as to which part of the EMR we can and can't use for clinical trials? And I'm curious from a uh, ML AI perspective, can this save us you know, in any way or are we uh, truly yeah. stuck with what data we have? So, so the data is really messy that's coming from electronic health records. No offense, Amy, your, yeah. yours is pristine. <laughs> um, and, and the same can be said about claims and even in really clinical trial data. Mm -hmm. And so, I think one of the beauties of EMR data is that it comes in large numbers. You have large N, uh, large number of patients, and so a lot of the noise ends up filtering out. And this goes back to what type of AI are you using to extract insights? If you're just doing correlation-based analysis, i.e. deep learning and the like, then you're gonna find a lot more false positives and false negatives because it's correlations. If you're trying to, if you are now using tools that can extract causality, it helps to boil out a lot of that noise and a lot what of you, that. What do you mean by that? Can you, can you expand on that causality? This is an yeah. important Yeah, so topic. there's been some advances in the world of, of, uh, of statistics all the way to causal inference where probabilistically it's possible to pull out from observational studies cause-effect relationships between variables, meaning between drugs and, and molecular entities of a patient and outcomes or between uh, molecular and physiological uh, uh, areas. This requires huge amounts of computing power, uh, large and somewhat clean and often multi-layered data, but we are now starting to see results coming out from this that are truly striking. In fact, um, recently with one of our collaborators, the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, we discovered and validated with the Dana-Farber group a marker for stem cell transplant response. This was done from 645 patients worth of data, so not a terribly large data set, and certainly there is more prospective studies to be done, but this marker confers a 20-month progression-free survival benefit from um, from what's been uh, discovered and at least uh, and validated. Just, just to get to the, to the crux of that, how is that different than what would have been possible uh, with correlation or with uh, deep learning or other sort of machine learning techniques that we've all yeah. heard about? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's because we're, the technology is being used to not so much find patterns in the data, but really use the data as fuel to reconstruct the mechanisms of that complex system of the multiple myeloma patient, including the treatment <clears throat> arm, so that we can now simulate and do the counterfactual stem cell transplant on or off across all 645 patients to now reveal the responders and non-responders. That's the big difference between a deep learning approach and a causal approach, and I think it really kind of gets down to what I think is the elephant in the room in terms of this field. We're talking about an industry that has an 80% failure rate mm -hmm. in clinical development. There's no other product-driven industry on the planet that can afford to do that, that's relying so much on trial and error approaches. And ultimately, the only thing that I think is gonna get us past that is the leveraging the data to start to now really model and understand the complex system of disease so that we understand what interventions are having which impact. I think they're directly tied to what we're talking about here in terms of clinical trials. But that means not only linking the clinical trial data, but also all the underlying biomedical data as well. Uh, and that's where it's kind of the most powerful 
um, to do. And I think so, so you need systems that will allow the clinical data and the outputs and all the parameters to be able to talk to and be informed by that underlying corpus of biomedical data, I think. So one thing that we're seeing as it relates to this is the importance of then understanding data and context. Yep. So being able to link data sets and then understand the interrelationship between here's the features of the patient, this is the treatment that they received, right. and here's the outcome, and already understanding from your data sets that this is what context looks like. When we think about generating clinical trials data sets, we set up context in action by setting up a clinical trials data set. And our task with many of the data sets that are now being aggregated across the space is to make sure that we do the same thing to set them up in that ordered sequence. The other piece, though, is that not only do you need to understand how to set them up, which means you understand the clinical features that you're looking at within the data set, but you also need to have enough understanding of where the data set is likely to be messy or unreliable, such as cut and paste errors, and where's the data set likely to be very highly reliable, such as the time of a critical treatment decision. And so those are, those are key features that are really important in order then ultimately to use these data sets going forward. But, but also I think um, we heard this morning a lot about the analysis of uh, polysomnography and uh, epileptic uh, you know, sort of data. Um, the ability through wearables and other sensor technology to get much more objective, clean data Hitherto, people have shied away from some of it because it's actually been too complicated to analyze and especially overlay it with the other features, the other behavioral or physiological outcomes that you're looking at in the trial. Now, with the ability of AI machine learning to really be able to interrogate and integrate that data and look for patterns, I think that helps in terms of being able to, first of all, get real-world outcomes that are meaningful for patients but are objectively measured and secondly, be able from the point of view of a company to pull out those facets that are really uh, important for determining drug response. One of the examples here is the uh, six minute walk test, which is being used particularly within the cardiovascular field, where we now can maybe substitute that with um, tracker data in terms of the steps being made or the speed of uh, walking um, and maybe some other uh, features which we can use in order to replace that six minute walk test, which is pretty unreliable. Um, and the question then becomes in terms of how do you validate these new data? Yeah. Are we are going to get similar outcomes with these new data compared to the former data which we generated through the six minute walk test? Uh, these kind of questions will uh, come up in the near future because these wearables are going to be used more and more not only the, uh, the iWatches and, and Fitbits and other tools which we are using, but also we have now clothing, which is registering quite a number of uh, uh, features of the, uh, how the body behaves. So uh, this is going to create a new field of research, in my view, uh, and needs quite some uh, additional validation also in order to make sure that the I mean, data can be used. It begs the question of what does validation mean? Uh, you know, is the six-minute walk test the gold standard? Uh, you know, it's just maybe what we've done so far, uh, but there might be other data sets that are produced. And just from an accident of chronology, if, if we've built the industry on six-minute walk test and now have something different, and the something different gives you something that disagrees with the six-minute walk test, which one's right? Yeah. Does anybody have Thank it? Yeah. Exactly. exactly. So, so I think that we can't forget in clinical trials we have another key recipient of the data and the knowledge, which is the um, regulatory agency. And so if we think about, for example, replacing the six-minute walk test with now what comes out of a sensor, for example, we need to make sure that not only have we done the validation work, but that the algorithms are now transparent enough and consistent enough that we can now have them audited for the task of the clinical trial. So one of the things that becomes really important as we think about the application of new data sets and AI to the clinical trial space is auditability and consistency of algorithms and development. Ramesh, I'm, I'm, so you oh. know, the thing that one of the things that worries me, many things worry me in this space, but one of the things that worries me is that let's go back to what what is the machine learning and deep learning, right? The, in the past, software used to be you you take an algorithm, you throw a piece of software at it, and you get a you get a computation at the end of the day. The output is the calculation. Whereas in deep learning and all, what we're talking about is that the output is put into the black box, 
right? The data is put into it, and the outcome is a software, is a piece of software. So we have to, we're just back to the old days of training the model with, with well annotated data. What we lack, I think, is really well annotated data. And so even in the age of, I mean, here we are talking about digital biomarkers and whatnot and wearables and comparing what is the gold standard in the lab versus the digital biomarker telling us on the wearable and how do we validate it, we don't have enough data to train the model to prove that it's a better model. And so overcoming this collection of data, standardizing of data, really is still the major bottleneck, I think, in our industry. So let me ask you another question. I know you had a point, Stephen. Uh, so if, if, if I'm a startup or a partner talking to a pharma group, clearly there's a lot of data. Eli Lilly has a huge amount of data mm -hmm. uh, sitting in, in, inside its walls. Um, at the same time, that's proprietary data. Mm -hmm. That's value to the start shareholders of Eli Lilly. Mm -hmm. How does one get to that part of the conversation where we talk to either multiple pharma groups and kind of find a way to unlock these gigantic data stores, is that just like a lost cause at this point? No, I think that actually there is a model that's emerging. Uh, I, I would point out the Atom initiative that has uh, been spearheaded first by GSK and now several other organizations are joining it. In the Atom initiative, uh, what they are doing is taking multiple pharma and multiple industry agents, uh, you know, agencies' data sets anonymizing the data sets, merging them together, and building a common model across the full data set. So if we take the, the compound collection of Eli Lilly, the collection from Pfizer and a number of other pharmas and line them up, you have a much, much better structure activity relationship in the case of discovery, and you can, get, you can build a better model with it. The challenge has always been, well, how am I gonna prevent my IP from leaking out by merging the data sets together? The initiative of Atom is to actually assure the, the protection of the IP, but leveraging that information in a way that gives them a, a better computational model. And so the Atom initiative is going to merge the data sets together, build better models, and then put the model itself in the open source. So there are ways I think we can get around this. Yeah, and the, in Europe, the Innovative Medicines Initiative 2 under Horizon 2020 has just issued a call from a number of pharma companies for SMEs to apply to develop platforms and models with shared data across all the companies. So I think there's beginning to be a recognition certainly amongst the major pharma companies, that this kind of sharing of data in a pre-competitive way that retains the IP uh, but can be utilized to, to, to train models is, is something that is going to have to happen. Yep. Stephen, you had a point earlier, and then I have a controversial question to pose to you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I was just going to uh, build on Amy's point about the regulators really um, drive a lot of this um, ability for us to make... Uh, advances in, in clinical trials in the sense that um, while there is a lot of discussion about the efficiency of trials and that we need to be um, making things uh, uh, cheaper and more nimble and being able to use data, um, when we get to the end of the trial and we present the data, there's a different standard that's being used to, to evaluate that data. And so that when a company uh, does a large-scale clinical trial and presents the data, um, there are people who come out to individual sites, look at individual um, patients, look at the notes of the investigator in the margins of the, um, in the, margins of the data books, uh, and then ask questions about those things or ask for justification of individual endpoints in trials that have thousands of, of endpoints. So in order for any of this stuff, which is technically possible, to really be able to be advanced uh, into clinical practice, there has to be an understanding that when those uh, mechanisms are used, that they will be acceptable uh, and that they will be allowed to be uh, used as the uh, evidence for which a drug can be approved. I think that's really a key point that, um, you know, that, the, that can we, we're getting closer to we can, but the question is, will they allow it? And we're not quite there yet, I think. Yep. In, in this regard, we, we are used in the moment to a paper trail uh, yep. of data. And this is going to be now a electronic trail of data. And hence, there are a number of aspects of the electronic trail of data which needs to be verified that the data which are being put in in the beginning are also coming out at the end of the process. And regulators in general are a little bit uncomfortable if they don't understand how these data are being transferred and what is happening to these data also in these algorithms. 
Um, I was recently at an MIT uh, a workshop where they explained to us that how these algorithms uh, work and they're using some particular hardware for that as well, which are sophisticated chips, which are being used also in, um, in, um, in computer games. Um, and, but nobody is able to tell exactly how these uh, learning uh, systems are working. And you can look into at different time points, but that doesn't give you the answer in terms of what is exactly happening to those data. And I think we need to, to make the regulators comfortable with the processing of these data uh, by maybe giving some examples and things like that and in, in order to, 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 uh, to make that happen. Many of you are interacting with the FDA and other regulatory agencies around these sorts of data sets. What's your sense? Are they open to it? Are they closed? Are they in the middle? So uh, my main job these days is interacting with the FDA. And I would say that they're incredibly open to trying to um, solve for new ways of using computation in the clinical trials and learning what works. What's been interesting is that everybody is a little bit reticent to go across the line. The sponsors are worried that this puts my development program at risk. The FDA is worried that we're not really sure what we're going to be able to say until we, are, we get to the point of the final review of the package. And so everybody's kind of sitting poised at the edge right now. But I would argue that the FDA is, if anything, very forward looking in this space. Do you see it being different in different countries? Um, Yes and no. Uh, our experience with the EMA has been that the EMA is also equally um, forward thinking and, and interested um, in moving this ball forward. Um, I certainly see the privacy um, conversations being different by country and uh, that's probably been um, a, a little bit more of the, the conversation for us. Yeah. So I would agree with Amy that the FDA is certainly more and more open to these types of approaches. And I think even the recent passage of 21st Century Cures is a big deal because it now allows the discovery of new knowledge uh, from observational data to expand labels of drugs. So that's a big deal. But I also do think that in addition to regulators like the FDA, and at least in this country, um, payers are becoming a more and more important audience earlier in the process, not just when the drug is approved, because we're now in an age where uh, our drugs are very, very expensive. And so therefore, for payers to ultimately cover these drugs, the right evidence of efficacy and value needs to be thought about early in the clinical trial process. And do keep in mind, payers are not constrained by the same way no. that regulators are, right? They, are, they can pay for what they want to pay for and not pay for what they don't want to pay for. And so I think in this country, we're starting to see these things uh, converge. Uh, more similar to how it is in Europe, where the payer and the regulator are sometimes the same. Yeah, and I think it's really going to enable uh, much more value-based pricing to, to be a reality with some of these more objective measures that we can look at. Yeah, well, one of the aspects of these early dialogues between the health technology assessment agencies and the regulators is in order to develop a development plan, a strategy, which permits to generate the evidence which is needed in order to get an approval, but also to get then the, um, the, the pricing and the reimbursement mm. of, the, uh, of these agencies. And uh, these agencies in general are more demanding, which we learned from the European experience. So I hope not that it will come here in the US, uh, but we see some convergence in this, uh, in this area, uh, of course. Stephen, I was gonna ask you earlier, um, you described in the beginning an SGLT2 uh, inhibitor that you're working on, half a billion dollar clinical trial over seven years. Um, and we talked a little bit about, look, there's large effect sizes, small effect sizes, and where can this data and, and these methods be used uh, successfully? Um, but let's say uh, we get there, right? We fix the EMR so that uh, people actually are updating it properly, which is clearly at least technically possible. Uh, you know. We have uh, the claims data, we have the endophenotype data uh, in there. Um, do we get to a point where we can run these trials in some sort of virtual fashion entirely? Uh, and, and if so, uh, you know, what sort of uh, economic impact can that have? Yeah, well, I, I may be the one on the panel on the, on the end of the line here, but. I think that the you know the real advance with those types of things when the EMR is um, you know able to be used for trials is going to be the speed of identifying large cohorts. 
Um, when we can have large cohorts, uh, we can randomize large cohorts. We don't need to have huge effect sizes to be able to run these trials efficiently. Um, when we can run trials in systems, uh, like the partner's healthcare system, for instance, you know, hundreds of thousands of covered lives, right? right? Um, then we can do these kinds of trials efficiently. I don't think we get to a point where we, where we don't randomize. I think, you know, there are people up here who might be, um, you know, who think that, that um, using causal algorithms and things like that replaces that. But I think ultimately uh, we, we still get fooled. Um, well, still let's, let's this ask that question. is associative. Does anybody think that we get to the point where this is done entirely in silico? I think we're on our way to getting to the point where most of it is gonna be done in silico. I still think we're gonna have randomized controlled trials. Yeah. Uh, more in a confirmatory way, but I think this industry is dead in you know, some number of years if we don't get to the point of being able to run in silico what-if experiments in a high-throughput fashion like the aerospace industry does. Imagine if the aerospace industry made airplanes like the way the pharma industry makes drugs. 10,000 planes would be made, they'd fly them all, and the ones that didn't crash would get, would get sold. All right? I didn't make that up, but, but I do really think we have to think a bit bolder here and, and see where this industry can go. It's not, it's not gonna be a complete flipping of a switch, but I do think the ability to integrate data to the point of now simulating drugs in, in silico cohorts and humans down to the molecular level, I think that's where we're going. I, oh, oh, I, oh, sorry. I think that the uh, human body is pretty complex, and um, I see some major challenges in order to achieve that. What I see much more on the near horizon is that by the authorities using these systems, which I talked about earlier on, these databases, that we will be able to get approvals with less medical evidence. And that medical evidence will then be generated when the product is on the market. And that they can verify that with these systems from an efficacy and from a safety perspective. And um, that will certainly reduce the cost overall of the system. Uh, plus the other aspects which we talked about, the uh, making the clinical trials much more rapid, uh, will certainly uh, lead to a reduction in cost. Coming back to the 80% um, of uh, the products which fail, um, I just want to give you a little bit of a, 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 a different number, and that is that in the phase three trials, we have about 40% which succeeds. Uh, there's a 60% failure, uh, which is still very, very high. But there is a group here in, the US, in, uh, in Boston, in Harvard, which, or the MIT, which has uh, done an analysis of the Pharma Projects database and looked at um, the uh, phase transition and the probability of technical success. And they have come up with uh, the predictability with these uh, AI systems of about something like 70 to 80%, which is pretty high in that area. I know that some companies are working on this and already have achieved higher probabilities. And so um, by also using these kind of things, maybe we will be able to uh, optimize our um, clinical development path for new medical products. I still want to get a dollar amount out of Stephen here. So <laughs> half a billion dollar trial. Uh, let's say we don't get, get to the point where it's totally in silico, but we, we get some additional efficiencies out of the various parts of the framework that you described. Yeah, I think. Where does it get to? Uh, I think you cut it by 90%. 90%. Okay, so even if we don't get to in silico, that's still transformative. Yeah, I threw the anchor way over there because I <laughs> yeah, brought you 90% of the way. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I would say, you know, and, and again, I think so much of this money is spent on uh, humans checking other humans' work in person. Um, you know, half of the money is spent with clinical monitors at clinical sites. I don't think that that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a regulatory requirement. Um, it's not uh, efficient and it's not effective. It doesn't necessarily pick out the problems. But I think getting rid of that piece of it cuts clinical trial costs by more than half. Yeah, and that's, not, we're ready to do that right now, I think. It's not sexy, but 40% of trials fail to recruit enough patients. And that is a huge uh, time and cost. So, you know, just actually solving that would make a big difference. I, I, I don't think it's about do we virtualize the clinical trial period? You know, we, we, we've tried to do that in the discovery space and we cannot virtualize a Petri dish yet. 
we still have to run the experiment. So we've modeled, we model, we model, and we still have to run the physical experiment to actually prove anything works in the lab long before we take it to the clinic. So I think the answer here more is like model a lot more so that we actually touch fewer patients to make a clinical trial successful. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's about zeroing out the number of patients that participate in a clinical trial, but much like we do in discovery, you model the heck out of it in order to reduce the number of actual experiments you run, but you still got to run some experiments. Yeah, Stephen, you made a point on our prep call uh, describing how so much of the cost of bringing a drug to market is these clinical trials. And it's shifted the incentives for funding and for uh, governance around clinical trials uh, towards uh, smaller trials. And to some degree, if we can figure some of these things out, dropping the cost by 90%, it would seem, as you're suggesting, would open up uh, uh, the capacity to go after indications that are actually public health sort of indications ra rather than uh, narrower indications that we can finance. You know, to me, when, when, when you framed it that way, I came to the conclusion uh, that you know, the topic of this trial, AI and, the co AI and the cost of clinical trials, if we can drop the costs and open up uh, innovation to all these other areas, uh, it kind of reframes it to me and makes me feel like, well, now we, well, now we have to do it. And it's actually a moral imperative. Um, so with that, uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody on the panel. I think we're at time here. Uh, maybe we can get a round of applause from the audience to wake everybody <laughs> up for the next, uh, next session here. So. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.